Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 472. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and it's Tuesday, January the 8th, 2019. Okay, welcome to another show. Let's get this out of the way up front. Audience participation. I need you to like the episode. It helps with the uh, Google indexing and the uh, Facebook indexing. If they see that people like it, they'll make it more available to you. Uh, please comment. We got 80 comments on our Monday show. Let's go for 100 this time. Uh, George, Gavin, and I can't be right on everything. So please, if you find a correction or something like that, actually, we are right on everything. Whatever. Comment and say we're right on everything. That's fine. Uh, subscribe. If you've not subscribed to the program, you just found this on the internet and you want to find out when the next episode's coming out, click the subscribe button and the little bell next to it. Finally, we have a podcast. If our faces are ugly and you don't want to look at us, you can just listen to us in a podcast. Let's move on to the news. Um, let's do a follow-up to our follow-up follow-up story. Uh, we reported back in the uh, uh, 12th century, 8th century, that there was a, a split in the Orthodox Church. I thought we'd uh, follow up and discuss a more recent split. I think we talked about it in our last episode. The uh, Russian and uh, Eastern Europeans, Ukrainians, uh, Russians have split their uh, Orthodox Church. What's the follow-up, George? Well, uh, Patriarch Cyril... Uh, did what I call a Khrushchev. He took off his shoe at the UN and he pounded the podium. And no, he wasn't at the UN, but he released a statement after Patriarch uh, Bartholomew of Constantinople issued a Tomas giving autocephalacy or independence to the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, saying that those, you, those in the Ukraine who are Orthodox should be Ukrainian Orthodox, not Russian Orthodox. This caused Kirill to go ballistic, and he said those who leave the Russian patriarchate to go to Kiev will go to hell. Uh, this was just a wonderful, wonderful uh, letter that he released. Uh, it, it's really bad in the Orthodox world right now. People are choosing sides. And it's a bit of a David and Goliath because there are only 3,000 members of Bartholomew's whole province in Constantinople or Istanbul where there are 100, I don't know, how, how, almost 100 million, 80 million, 100 million Russian Orthodox. And so Bartholomew's uh, punching above his weight uh, in some respects here. Well, it is. I mean, I want to put this in a, a bigger universal text, and that is, why do we split? I mean, if you look at 2,000 years of church history, you, you look at 2,000 years of churches splitting over big issues, sometimes little issues, sometimes whether we should use bread or wafer at communion, sometimes uh, we don't understand why churches are splitting. And I wanted to figure out if this is always a grass is greener on the other side. This is a conversation with the three of us. Um, or if there's good reasons to split. Gavin, you've left the Church of England. Obviously, you have found a reason to leave a church or, or denomination. Uh, is the grass always greener on the other side, or is that just a relativism on Kevin's part? Uh, well, it might be. <laughs> and might be. The, gra the, the, <laughs> the, the, grass, the grass is greener problem is certainly a normal part of human experience. But I think we can be a bit more, uh, a bit more canny and wise about the way in which schisms take place and, and, and when and where they matter. I think my view is that um, the, the different denominations or different parts of the church have virtues and vices. Uh, and, and their virtues are, are ones that we ought to recognize and each other's vices are things we ought to avoid. I, I think there are different times in history when certain virtues carry more weight and other times when the vices are more problematic. I think the real problem for the Western church is its vice that it's unable to stand up to the demands of secular culture as they come and go. And the great strength of orthodoxy has been its insistence on keeping the structures and the teaching and the integrity of the church apostolic. So the, the closer you get to the apostles in terms of the second, third and fourth and fifth centuries, the more real it is. Whereas 
we've taken a different view of the telescope and the further away you get the more developed and progressive you are so i i'm, I'm with the orthodox on that uh, gavin I, I i don't know if i buy what you're saying um the russian orthodox church has split three or four times they've been you know the first time around three of those times have to do entirely with culture uh the russian orthodox church had its first split over the calendar uh, the Russian Ox patriarch Kate wanted to follow the modern secular calendar, and the old, the old other people said, "No, we like what we have, even though it doesn't work." Uh, then we had the split of between Church Slavonic, the old believers, and the Russian Orthodox Church. We need to get the language modern. We need to have the language understandable, and we need to correct the errors. There was a split there, and then in the twenties, we had the split over communism, where the state uh, essentially. Put a patriotic Russian Orthodox Church in. Um, so two of the three splits, uh, all three of the three splits, had to do with the intersection of culture and the church. Now you can say that theologically speaking, the calendar really is not that big of a deal, whereas the uh, 1920s, where the state uh, is master over the church, that was a big deal. So yes, you're right. But at the same well, time, I don't want to paint the Russian Orthodox Church and the other Orthodox churches as being so wonderful because they've received an unbroken transmission of apostolic faith for 2,000 years. Yes, well, I, but... Well, I think Gavin's point would be that the structures are there. You know, we, we've certainly uh, seen other denominations wipe out their structures. Kevin, you're coming to my rescue. Thank you. I think George and I, George and I are both, well, I'm grateful. George and I are both right. What George has said is true, though I, I think without becoming too arcane, uh, those stresses within orthodoxy were still about the extent to which apostolic practice, original practice, gets modified by the, the transmission of history and culture. That, that's true. But I think... Um, the bigger problem for us is that um, in the West, we have been so amenable to being impressed by passing culture. Oh, sorry, that's a news flash coming in. <laughs> What's the flash? It sounds pretty important. <laughs> uh, no, another stabbing in London. Somebody has died. God bless them. Well, oh, no. All right. um, so I, th I think my problem with the Western church, if you're asking about uh, um, whether the grass is greener, is that if you have bad clergy, bad bishops, bad appointments, you can recover from them if the structure and the integrity of the church remains, even though, as George says, it gets stressed all the time. Um, the history of the church is, is constant stress, constant division, a constant attempt at trying to mend it. But there are certain things which you cannot survive uh, and recover from. And one of those things has happened in Anglicanism in the Church of England, and that is uh, an adoption of secular values that simply run contrary to revelation and to Christian holiness. Now, if, if you if you have bad appointments, bad bishops, bad priests, it's like tenants in a building. They come and they go. At some point, they'll be replaced by decent tenants. But Not if you if you they last forever in Europe, but go yeah, on. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but if you, if if you don't pay attention to the fact that the foundations of the church have been removed, if someone tries to build an underground swimming pool instead, uh, that the place will will fall down. Well, one of the ways that I think that we we one of the strengths of the argument of this is if you look at the Russian Orthodox Church, which had some very bad place men in throughout communism. You had people who were appointed who weren't believers; they were just KGB agents sent in to um, babysit the church. Uh, nonetheless, once communism failed, because the essential sacramental and apostolic structures of the church remained in place, you found the most incredible, unbelievable religious revival taking place since 1989. Now, that can happen if you keep the apostolic structures and the, ch and the church of the church in place. It can't happen if, as you do in the West, and particularly in, in Anglicanism, and the Church of England, you modify the apostolic and biblical DNA of the church, and you produce instead a, a, a piece of secular religion with a Christian gloss on it. You, you're really in trouble. Gavin, so, you uh, mentioned to me, uh, you mentioned to us uh, about, uh, not, about a statement you read put out by Michael Green, the Church of England evangelist. Uh, it's since disappeared from the internet, where he essentially he takes to test the Bishop of Oxford for doing exactly what you're saying of changing the DNA. What was going on there? I didn't catch that. Well, 
before it disappeared. It, 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 so it disappeared, but I, I read it and was very impressed by it. And Michael Green said a number of things. He first of all said, um, well done, Bishop of Oxford, on being courteous and listening to people. That's a good thing. So always praise your enemies. It means that the stiletto is going to appear when you least expect it to be beautifully poised. He then went on to say that um, if you're standing for, if, if you're going to pay more attention to the LGBTQ issues, uh, what are you doing about bisexuality? Because as far as he, Michael can, said, this is sexual omnivorousness. And, and where do you place that in the in the Christian tradition? Haven't you got a problem with not distinguishing b between your LGBTQ and, and other uh, um, elements of that? But then he thirdly went on to make his most important point and to said, um, what, what you don't appear to have understood is that the heart of Christianity is, is holiness. The whole project <clears throat> of the Old Testament, of Judaism, of this, the internalizing of the law is holiness. Um, and in terms of the way you are dealing with the, with the, um, the conversation between the church and human sexuality, you appear to be doing very well on therapy and pastoral care and listening and inclusion, but you've paid no attention whatsoever to holiness. Why have you let it go? Look in the New Testament, you'll, you'll see it's the main thrust both in the Gospels and in the epistles, and you don't seem to have any place for it at all. So would you like to reconsider your listening process and try and build it around holiness and give, give more uh, stress to holiness and bisexuality? Now, sadly, it disappeared from the internet. <laughs> when I asked why, one of the people who put it up said, Michael Green needs a, a PTO, permission to officiate from the Bishop of <laughs> Oxford. And, and he's decided to make this I, I guess it's become a private rather than a public communication. Well, Michael Green's perfectly entitled to do that, but it would be sad if, if, uh, if it is the case that the atmosphere in the Church of England is so repressive that somebody of Michael's stature is unable to reply to a public letter with a public letter. Uh, Gavin, one of the things I've been, been privileged in my time as a writer is gotten to know a number of the leading lights of the liberal church. And... In my conversations with Gene Robinson going back now 20 years, he would claim the mantle of holiness. Uh, in other words, he would say that what he believes, God is doing a new thing, and he is responding in holiness to what he believes God is doing. And in some respects, I have more uh, respect for Gene Robinson than, the, than for most of the bishops of the Church of England and the Episcopal Church who are simply placemen just like the ones in the Russian Orthodox Church, instead of the KGB putting them in charge, the Crown Appointments Commission did. How do you respond to these people who claim that they are practicing a form of holiness, even though it is not tied to the Bible, but to their own lights? I mean, how do we push well, back? I, how? Well, I, I, just because somebody uses a word, we, we, uh, we don't need to accept it. I'm afraid. I, I think it's a smokescreen. I mean, it, this, this is, it seems to me very often in Christian circles, you, you get a, a form of blackmail. If we use the right words, um, then, then we become untouchable. You can't criticize us. And I'm afraid, I think I see, uh, I see Gene Robinson claiming holiness as uh, a form of, of uh, an insurance policy. R real holiness um, seems to me to take place where you have um, where you have miracles taking place, miracles of healing, miracles of conversion, miracles of repentance. There is a, there is a transformation that accompanies holiness. I think I would say to Bishop Gene Robinson, show me where the cash value of your holiness lies. In, 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 where has it had traction in terms of bringing the kingdom of heaven into people's lives? And then I don't know what he would answer, but I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't see the currency of holiness there. However, um, at least, I think what you are saying is at least he was passionate about his heresy. The problem with the Church of England seems to me that it's very hard to find any passion within the practitioners of the state religion in many places. Everyone seems, not everyone, it's a terrible, we have entered a climate of, of um, uh, causing as little trouble as possible. Uh, you, George, you have a phrase which is go along to get along, which I, 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 I keep on thinking is a very good way of describing it. Uh, Kevin, have you placed your bet uh, with William Hill, the bookmaker in London?
<laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because they, well, there, they there's, are, yeah. uh, our problem is there's so many good stories this week. Uh, we've heard rumors and saw uh, there's a, a betting uh, as to who's going to be the next uh, Bishop of London. We got this letter. No, no, uh, Archbishop of York. What? It's going to be I the next Bishop. Of London. Here's the problem, guys. We get together, we talk, and I have to make sure the three of us are equally separated apart, that we all have good audio, <laughs> and you guys are talking about the good stuff in the background when I'm setting up all the good technical stuff. And so there's some issues with my catching up sometimes during the show. Yes, Archbishop of York, the rumors are out there that it's going to be repl he's going to be replaced by a female bishop. Um, I heard Durham? No, no, no. Uh, the three front... This isn't working. Hold on. I heard Darby? No. <laughs> Darby is one of them, but not a front runner. The three front runners, meaning that they're three to one odds, are Helen Ann Hartley, who's a Suffragan bishop in the north somewhere, uh, Cyril Mullally, the Bishop of London, and Stephen Cottrell, the Bishop of Chelmsford. The Bishop of Derby, Libby Lane, she is on that second uh, rung of... Uh, yeah, if if you wanted to make money, you'd vote. You you'd put your money down for her to place her show, but not to win. Um, but the bookkeepers are basically saying that uh, the odds are that the next Archbishop of York is going to be a woman, and the women that they have tapped are the quintessential placemen. Yes, men. Yes, women. Uh, empty suits. Well, I want to be very honest here. Within a dozen years, ten years. The only choices available of all the bishops will be women in the Church of England. Uh, that's the trajectory. Now, Gavin, when we shared this information with you, you were, what's the word, appalled, uh, flabbergasted. Uh, do you think... Uh, <laughs> Look, he's Hartley, keeping his lips closed because he doesn't want to go there. <laughs> danger, Helena Hartley danger, is Sarah danger, Mulally, danger. or Libby Lane uh, are up to being Archbishop of York? Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. Um, I, I think we have to be very careful about criticizing other people in public office when we don't know them. And uh, I am very hesitant to say things about, about, about people, but I'm underwhelmed by the track records of the people you've talked about. I would like to see people who had an air of holiness about them. I'd, I'd like to see people who had a distinct, distinctiveness to their Christian discipleship that made other people want to follow them. Uh, I, I'd like to see that as a holiness in terms of, of um, bringing a level of spirituality, of renewal, of repentance, of conviction. Um, but my difficulty is when I look at the Church of England as we have it now, we, we seem to have a number of managerial bureaucrats, people who are good at managing and good at bureaucracy. So it could very well be that all the people you've mentioned are really very good at certain things. But if what they're good at is management and bureaucracy, this won't serve the church very well. Well, okay, Gavin, I'm going to throw a curveball. Actually, I'm going to throw a beanball at you and aim right at your head. These are baseball analogies. So if you don't, you'll know when it hits you in the head. But if you it's, look it's a Yorker. Ball. You're going to bone me a Yorker. Or a Yorker. Or a... That's right. <laughs> but if I were to look for the, uh, the odor of holiness, uh, why isn't... Uh, uh, the pedophile bishop, Bishop Ball, why didn't he go to the very highest level? I mean, the world saw him as a wonderful man doing great works. He could point to these things, yet within his secret life, he was a monster. Um, is the I church think, yes, well, safe just to have these non-entities who can't do anything worse, rather than these great men and women who may be wonderful here, but have these secret sins there? Peter Ball is one of the most problematic people you could ever raise because at a psychological and a spiritual level. At your head. <laughs> that, that, that's a real, it's a real Yorker you have both. Yeah, it is a good Yorker. Um, let's, let's, let, let me, let's go somewhere else instead. Let's talk about uh, uh, Michael Ramsey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, let me use Michael Ramsey as an example of holiness. Michael Ramsey was a man who clearly said his prayers and meant his faith. And in what he wrote and in what he preached and the way he looked, you thought, here is somebody who has gone on a real journey in the Christian faith. He's, go he's gone somewhere, seen things and produced things 
that the rest of us were hungry for and wanted. I think the problem with Peter Ball is he was a showman. He pretended holiness. It was charm, a kind of spiritual and religious charm that he exercised on people. Uh, and but so one of the, we have to distinguish between the charmers and the holy people. Michael Ramsey, although he's not the most sane man in the world, his his track of mental health wasn't phenomenally impressive. There was nonetheless something about him that was utterly authentic in his relationship. I suspect Michael Ramsey really prayed and he really struggled. And if you want to you want to to, to dis describe what holiness is, then I think. And it's a very difficult thing to describe. You kind of know it when you see it. I would say it's to do with the, with the amount of prayer that people put in and the amount of struggle with one's self one engages in. Uh, but you, we don't have many holy people. Um, th there have been some. I thought David Watson was a man who had the air of holiness about him. And then when, if, you, if you then ask my question about Gene Robinson, so where's the current tea and attraction in your holiness, David Watson? The I, answer is in the, in the thousands of people he attracted to Jesus. Now, let me say, I didn't say that I saw the holiness in Gene Robinson. Gene Robinson claimed the Saw the holiness, <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> Just as you read, uh, I think, Jane Ozan, uh, who's written the, her recent autobiography and her statements, she wears this mantle of holiness, which comes across to me as self-righteousness, uh, of claiming uh, God's anointing. When there's, well, the, the, when I see no I evidence mean, of it. The, it, it absolutely, you know, one of the one of the one oh one lessons in Christianity is all, all you can do is say, "Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner." If you really do begin to present yourself as having got anywhere, as in Gene Robinson saying, "Well, you know, my holiness consists in my my passion for my sexuality." Uh, I won't say anything about Jane Ozan. She's living and current, and I'm, I'm not prepared to criticize her as a person. But 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 I I I, I agree. Um, if if I may be very rude for a moment, in my in my law more liberal days, I remember. No, I, I won't say it. It's it's too rude. You have to cut it out. So I'll save Ken an editing job. Uh, <laughs> I'm cutting this part out. People don't know. I'm cutting this out. Well, let's go back to the the two examples that were put on the the board: Ramsey and, and Ball. If I remember correctly, one had clear warning signs, the other didn't. One lived above reproach, the other there were some warning signs, um, yes, and it, it, it was found in, in the people around him. Said, "Yeah, this doesn't look right. This doesn't look right." And you you can say the person is living a holy life, but if you're having questions and the people around them are having questions, and they're not above reproach, then there's your sign. There's, we need to back up and say, uh, is this person really living a holy life? And you always see that. There's always, um, when a, a, a person you thought was great fell, all of a sudden the people that were next to him said, wow, we, we, we saw this coming. Well, what do you mean you saw this coming? You never said nothing. Well, it was it was so-and-so. We weren't going to say nothing. And so... I'm, I'm, I'm a bit uncomfortable with that, Kevin, because I, I think one of the things we've, we... One thing we don't often understand is is that the the holier someone tries to be, the more they attract the enemy, and uh, um, it's it's easy to be a nondescript Christian. <laughs> you you don't get you know the Holy Spirit doesn't doesn't have much traction and the enemy doesn't bother you. You just if you're you know, saying money blandness. and power are very tempting, absolutely. Okay, uh, but you can see a person who's fallen into those temptations by the people who know the best. I want to jump in and sort of change directions and basically point where I see examples of holiness at work in the church. Sure. Uh, the, the bishop who ordained me for the Episcopal Diocese of Pittsburgh almost 25, almost 25 years ago was Bob Duncan. Now, I didn't agree with Bob on every issue. Um, uh, we have a different churchmanship, but there was about him an aura of holiness that you just... And for this, he was detested by a large number of bishops in the Episcopal Church. And the reason why he was detested, you would, you know, people would say, oh, well, he's, he is uh, self-righteous, self-indulgent, this and that. Bob Duncan was never that way uh, that I saw him. And I sat through hundred, uh, hundreds of hours of House of Bishops meeting. But he was consistently speaking the truth. I saw this in Keith Ackman. I see this in Foley Beach. And 
Mm, I think I there's I think there's a function of the Holy Spirit working with failed, fallen, broken people. Um, I haven't looked at Bob Duncan's credit record, and I am not his analyst, so I don't know how perfect he is. But I do know that the works of his his ministry are self evident, and to me, that that's an example of the holiness that his work work through him with the power of the Spirit. So we could we could talk about uh, the the virtues of churches that elect their bishops as opposed to the churches that produce them through committees. Uh, but in the end, I don't think bland bureaucracy is the is is the is a sufficiently important hallmark of Christian leadership and responsibility. If you don't have holy people, then you, I think you're in trouble as a church. Would Michael Ramsey make it through the Crown Appointments Commission? Would he I make the coordination so. conference? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> okay. I got two of the smartest people I know here. How are we going to take this all the way around from uh, dividing churches, holiness, and, and finish out our program? Well, uh, I'll be I'll be George, uh, okay. which is uh, I'll get get out and pump pump my Bible and be a good Protestant and say the power of the Holy Spirit's at work in the church. Men are flawed, men are broken. Most people are going to go straight to hell. I believe with Kirill on this point, but at the end of the day, we have to be faithful and trust the Lord to do what God has called to do in the little vineyards that we've been called to work. Now that may seem pietistic, it may seem defeatist, it may seem go along to get along uh, to some people. But I do see God's, I see God's holiness at work in the small things of life, in the, in the parish level. I see it all the time. And I don't, the Diocese of Central Florida is having a crisis right now. One of the parishes announced that it's going to have a gay wedding in February. It's the only one. And the bishop has basically said, fine, you do that. You go your own way. You're no longer washing your hands. And this is, is existentially destructive because it breaks the unity of the clergy, it breaks the unity of the diocese, it sort of pulls us into the sex wars. But by the same token, God is going to prevail. Whether this diocese of Central Florida will prevail, I have no clue, but God is in charge. I've still been... Folks, now let's bless the collection plate. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm still... Um very moved by my by the the readings from the book of revelation that we had in advent up to christmas and i'm i'm finding the power of the early chapters of revelation has stayed with me and that is the encounter between the seven churches and and jesus with jesus saying well done on on these things you've done them well but look i have these other things against you uh i think that uh, one of the things that, that we ought to do as Christians is to hold ourselves continually accountable for those failures that S Scripture tells us matters. And, and, and interestingly enough, in, in those encounters with Christ, he was very serious about false teaching and, and the perversion and the distortion of the apostolic faith. Um, the wonderful news is that, that when we acknowledge our failures and our mess, uh, our Lord picks us up and invites us to start again. The, the, the really exciting thing about the kingdom of heaven is that whatever the world throws at it, the gates of hell do not prevail. So we're, we are, we're, we're not on the winning side. I think that's, 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 too, um, that's too superficial. We are engaged in a project that God will bring to completion. And whatever our, our, own, um, whatever our own limitations, God is bigger than our limitations, and we can be grateful for that. I want to really, uh, as we close out, focus on holiness. Uh, one of my favorite things as a layperson is joining a Bible study of Romans. And I love uh, watching other people when they read Romans going, it is the law. It's all about the law. You a little further, it's not about the law. I thought it was about the law. And as you, as you finish out, it's, it's about holiness. Yeah. It's about mm -hmm. holiness. And all of Scripture, the Old Testament and the New Testament, lead us to the call to be holy. And it's something that we want to be sure our audience understands. Uh, in all this division we find in the church, you are called to be holy. And I think we'll close the program with that. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. You've been listening 
to episode 472 of Anglican Unscripted on the 8th of January 2008.